Okay, it's uh, five past three, I think it's good to start. So welcome everyone. Um, this is the ninth session, if I remember well. Roughly every two weeks we get together um, to talk about uh, the latest works uh, in quantum computing and simulation from different distinguished groups and speakers around the world. I'm very glad to introduce uh, Christian Kokail from uh, Peter Choller's group in Innsbruck today. Um, to uh, the theorist, he's uh, towards he, his end of his PhD uh, at uh, Innsbruck. Uh, he did his uh, undergraduate in uh, University of Kratz, and he has been working on quantum computing, quantum optics, and quantum simulation for some time there with uh, Peter Choller. So, Christian, the floor is yours. Ah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure for me uh, giving this talk. Um, today, I, I would like to tell you about our, our latest work, uh, which is actually not published yet, I have to say. We are about of, of writing this up, uh, which is uh, about entanglement Hamiltonian tomography. And what this is, is um, an efficient way of extracting the reduced density matrix from a quantum system. And in particular, also an efficient way for extracting entanglement properties like the entanglement spectrum. And I will explain what this means in all detail in, in a couple of minutes. Um, this approach is particularly suited for quantum simulation. And I will also explain why this is. And because of this, and because this is the, the web series on quantum computation and quantum simulation, I will say a couple of words uh, about quantum simulation and in particular the types of quantum algorithms we are interested in here in Innsbruck at the moment. Uh, and uh, this will also somehow provide us, so, so from this quantum computation and quantum simulation tasks, we get interesting quantum states uh, which we later can analyze with this, with this method. Uh, so if you think about um, modern quantum technologies, uh, there are basically two types of uh, areas. Uh, uh, basically, you can, you can investigate. Uh, the first one would be so, sort of digital quantum computing, and I give here some examples for experimental platforms, which uh, nowadays work as fully fledged quantum computers. Examples include ions confined to harmonic traps as we have here in Innsbruck and also uh, at the University of Maryland and at NIST, for instance. And of course, very recently, we have seen uh, very impressive experiments with uh, superconducting qubits at Google and, and IBM. And in this digital quantum computing, we think uh, in terms of this quantum logic network. So experiments are carried out usually in such a way that you prepare an initial state, which is usually an, an, a state that is easy to prepare. And then you execute a quantum circuit, which consists of two qubit gates, which entangle the qubits with each other, and maybe also some, some single qubit rotations. And in the end, uh, you have you perform a measurement and you read out the qubits. Uh, now, usually, it's like this: that from from a single shot, from a from a single run of such a circuit, you do not learn much. So, what you have to do is you have to repeat these experiments over and over again. Uh, and from the statistics that you see, so from all these measurement outcomes, you can infer some information, uh, some information about your quantum state. So here, this is about demonstrating uh, quantum algorithms. And the second uh, realm, I would say, is uh, this field of quantum simulation. And here we usually start with a physics problem. So we have an interesting problem in physics that we would like to solve. And I took here as an example that the famous Fermi-Hubbard model in 2D uh, which is supposed to explain or capture this high TC superconductivity. So there are very important questions in this model, like does, is there a D-wave superconducting phase existing? 
And what we do in quantum simulation is these kind of models are usually too hard to solve them on a classical computer. Uh, so we built sort of uh, quantum systems. And in this case of the Hubbard model, what people do is they load cold atoms into optical lattices. And in this optical lattice, they, the atoms, they can tunnel around. And if they are on the same side, they have an on-site interaction. And if you write down the Hamiltonian for this quantum optical system, it actually matches uh, the structure of the Hamiltonian of this Fermi Hubbard model. So you can use such a quantum simulation uh, to answer interesting questions in physics. Um, so the difference between these two approaches is in this quantum computing um, framework, uh, this is usually fully pro programmable, meaning to it that you have a universal set of gates. At the moment, um, most systems that exist are restricted to a small number of qubits. And if you really run, want to run large scale quantum algorithms, you will need error correction here. Uh, and on the quantum simulation side, we have uh, really the, the, the systems that are built here at the moment, they are scalable to, to large system sizes and to a large number of particles. Uh, this is not a universal approach. So these devices are sort of built for a particular purpose, like in this case for the Fermi Hubbard model. So they realize a restricted class of Hamiltonians. However, these quantum simulators nowadays can be perform operations with very high fidelity. So these are the sort of two types of, uh, uh, of doing quantum simulation and quantum computation, either the digital or the analog way. Uh, there, is another <clears throat> uh, there is another approach we got very interested in here in Innsbruck recently. Uh, and you can see this as a third way of doing quantum simulations, which is the variational approach. And here, uh, the biggest difference is uh, that the biggest difference to analog quantum simulation is that uh, the model that you want to study uh, only exists as a measurement recipe on the classical computer. So in contrast to analog quantum simulation, uh, where you really try to uh, to build the quantum system that matches the Hamiltonian that you want to study. Uh, here, uh, your model only exists as a classical computer and only as a measurement recipe for, so, so a, a measurement recipe for the energy of this model. Uh, so this variational quantum simulations or variational quantum eigensolvers became very prominent recently and how it works is the following. So we have here our traditional quantum circuit. You start with an initial state uh, and you execute a gate sequence. So as an, as an example here, you have operations that entangle the qubits with each other. Uh, then you perform some single qubit rotations uh, and again, an entangling operation and so on. You iterate between these operations uh, and every one of these operations holds a, a variational parameter. And what you get out in the end at this stage is uh, perhaps a highly entangled quantum state that depends on these variational parameters. Uh, and then you can perform your measurement and collect some measurement data. And this measurement data are sent to a classical computer. And on this classical computer, from this measurement data, you can now calculate uh, the energy of your model if you have a measurement recipe on how to extract the energy from the measurement data. And what the classical computer is doing here, so you, you have on the classical computer, you have an optimization algorithm that tries uh, to minimize uh, the energy uh, over these parameters. So it's a feedback loop where from the measurement data, you calculate the energy, uh, you uh, you, op you optimize for the energy and you find the optimal parameter vectors. Um, so let me make this once more clear again. So in this kind of approach, you have a certain resource in the lab and you have a certain target model that you want to study. And in contrast to analog quantum simulation, uh, this resource and target, they can be really different from each other. 
Um, and something that we have done here in Innsbruck in a collaboration with the Iron Trap experimentalists was uh, as a resource, so this is this thing that executes the quantum circuit here, as a resource we were using this Iron Trap quantum simulator uh, which can realize uh, a long-range easing model. Uh, so this is kind of an operation that can be used to entangle the qubits with each other. And uh, in this kind of machines, you also have single qubit control over the individual ions. And with these two, res these two resources can be used to prepare variational states. Uh, and as a target model, we were studying um, a very peculiar model, which is called the lattice schwinger model. And this is a model for, that describes uh, quantum electrodynamics in one spatial dimension. So you see here really that the resources that you have in the lab and the model that you study in the end uh, can be completely different. Um, so let me show you uh, how, this, how this works in practice, uh, or let, let, me, let me add here, uh, just to repeat again, this is a very flexible approach. The resources can differ from the target. Um, and we also uh, uh, extended this thing by a self-verification procedure. And uh, what you can do is not, from the measurement data, you can not only infer the, the expectation value of your target Hamiltonian, but you can also measure the variance uh, of the of the target Hamiltonian in your variational state. So the energy, the energy fluctuations. And if the energy fluctuations are zero, this tells you that you are in an eigenstate. Um, so let me show you some results. So these are really data, uh, data from the lab. Um, what, what I show you here is one of these optimization trajectories. So, so you see here the energy versus the iteration number of the optimization algorithm. Uh, one, each point here uh, consists out of 90 measurements uh, that, that come from the lab. So what we do here is we send these variational parameters to the quantum device and, and repeat the circuit 90 times. And from these 90 measurements, we can calculate one of these uh, energy expectation values. In this inset, you can see that these energy expectation values have error bars. And um, this orange line here shows uh, the current estimate of the global minimum uh, of our algorithm. And you can see that as a function of the iteration, this algorithm converges uh, to, the, to the minimum, uh, to, to, the, to the ground state energy. Uh, this black dashed line here is the ground state energy of this lattice Schwinger model. And uh, this orange line here is the energy of the first excited state. So you see that the energy is really very much within the gap. Um, we can also, uh, you, you might wonder why are there so many points? Why does this fluctuate so around, uh, so, so enormously here? And this has to do with the fact that we are using uh, a global optimization algorithm uh, that kind of always has exploration steps where it sort of explores the energy landscape, but also steps where it focuses tighter in on, on promising regions. Uh, and another thing uh, we did was calculating the fidelity. We only can do this theoretically. Uh, so what we do here is we take the variational parameters that we send to the quantum device. And with these variational parameters, we prepare a quantum state on, a classical, on our classical computer. And we calculate the theoretical fidelity with respect to the true ground state. Uh, and uh, this reaches here 85%. This was a variational quantum simulation that we performed uh, for 20 ions. So we prepared the ground state uh, of this Schwinger model uh, on 20 ions. Uh, this plot here basically shows that, that there is sometimes a competition between local minima. So this kind of fingers that you see here means that the optimization algorithm focus in, in, into some region of parameter space uh, and uh, this, this can happen sometimes, and here it happened two times, and in the end it, it was choosing a, min a minimum that is closer to the correct uh, target state. Um, 
I want to show you one more slide about this until I, I come to the actual to the actual topic uh, of this talk, which is about the entanglement Hamiltonian tomography. Another thing that you can study with this approach are uh, quantum uh, phase transitions. So you in in this Schwinger model. Um, there is a certain parameter in this target Hamiltonian, which is a mass. I don't want to go into the details, but as you tune the mass uh, in this Schwinger model from negative to positive values, uh, there, there is a second order quantum phase transition between two phases. And these two phases are uh, given by this, by this anti-ferromagnetic uh, product states. Um, and uh, you can see this phase transition by measuring, uh, by measuring a particular order parameter. Uh, and what we can do in the experiment, we can just prepare the ground state of the Schwinger model for different parameters of this mass and measure this order parameter. And what we find are these points here with the corresponding error bars, which matches pretty well with the theoretical value, which is this solid line here. Uh, and another thing, uh, you, we can we can measure is uh, the entanglement entropy. So this is an experiment that has that, ha that had been done for eight ions, uh, and what we did is we separated these eight ions into two subsystems A and B, uh, and we have a protocol that has been uh, developed by Andreas Elben and, and co-workers. Uh, that can be used to measure the purity of such a subsystem. And the purity of a subsystem is a measure uh, of entanglement. And you see that uh, as a function of this mass parameter, uh, at, at the phase transition, there is, uh, there is a maximum amount of entanglement in the system. Uh, so this slide basically shows that it is interesting uh, that the quantum states that we prepare by our quantum simulation tools uh, to analyze the, them further. Either we measure some interesting order parameter or uh, we investigate entanglement properties uh, of these of this quantum states. So here we were just looking at one particular property, which is this purity, but there are also other interesting entanglement properties. And uh, in our most recent work, uh, we investigated if we can do if we can uh, measure some more interesting things than this purity. Can we, for instance, measure uh, a von Neumann entropy or maybe even the full entanglement spectrum? Uh, and this now naturally connects to, um, to our most recent work on entanglement Hamiltonian tomography. And uh, so let me jump right away to our main goal, what we, what we want to do. Our main goal is uh, an experimental measurement of the entanglement spectrum in a quantum many-body system. So let me, let me explain to you what, what this means. Assume that, that you have a certain quantum system that is in a pure state, uh, and you can choose an arbitrary bipartition. So you choose two subsystems, A and B, of your quantum system. And of course, if the total quantum system is in a pure state, you can always write it in this form some coefficients and uh, uh, basis states on the subsystem A and basis states on the subsystem B. Uh, what you can do now is you can interpret these coefficients as a matrix and do a singular value decomposition of these coefficients. And if you plug this singular value decomposition back into this formula, you can see immediately that you can write the quantum state in this form. Uh, it's a sum over the singular values times uh, uh, a new type of basis states on the subsystem A and as of the subsystem B that are then defined in this way, which you can see immediately if you plug this into this formula. So from this representation, you can also immediately see that this lambda alpha, the, the singular values that come from the decomposition of this coefficient, uh, that this lambda alpha tell you something about the entanglement of the subsystem A with the rest. Uh, imagine that there is only one singular value, which is one, uh, then your system would separate into a pure state on subsystem A, tensor a pure state on subsystem B, which means that there is no correlation between, between the two subsystems. 
And as soon as, soon as you have several singular values, uh, then you have here a superposition of different states. And this means that the subsystem A and B are correlated with each other. So this, this lambda alphas here, they really hold the information about the entanglement. Uh, this is also, from, from this representation, you can immediately also calculate the reduced density matrix. This is, uh, the tr the, you, from the global density matrix, you trace out the subsystem B to get the reduced density matrix for the subsystem A. And this can then be written uh, in this form, where, where the eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix are the lambda alpha this lambda alpha squared and they are normalized to one. The sum over all lambda alpha squared has to be one. What I'm going to do now is to write uh, this reduced density matrix in a, in a slightly different form. Uh, you can interpret the reduced density matrix as a thermal state. Imagine you write this as e to the minus beta sum Hamiltonian which would be a thermal state in a canonical ensemble. Um, and if you write this in the eigenbasis, you would write it like this, where the eigenvalues are now e to the minus xi alpha. And this e to the x minus xi alpha are the lambda alpha squared uh, from before. Uh, this is just a, a different interpretation. Uh, this Hamiltonian here, this, this Hamiltonian HA is called the entanglement Hamiltonian. Uh, and what this means is that uh, you can, uh, the entanglement uh, can somehow be seen as, as, a te as the temperature in this thermal state. So if you, if you would just have one of these lambda alpha squares, you would have zero temperature. And uh, th th this corresponds to an infinite value of this beta. And there would be no entanglement between subsystem A and B. Uh, and if you have several of these values, uh, then of course this means that you have a finite temperature. So long story short, the, the, the temperature of the subsystem basically tells you something about the entanglement in this representation. And um, the remaining talk is really about this entanglement Hamiltonian. And what we finally want to measure are these eigenvalues of the entanglement Hamiltonian, these Xi alphas, which, which is called the entanglement spectrum. Um, you might ask, why is it interesting? Uh, from this entanglement spectrum, we can uh, calculate a lot of things. We can calculate all types of entanglement measures, measures not only the purity or the Rainy entropy that I showed before, uh, but you can also calculate the von Neumann entropy from this uh, from these eigenvalues. Uh, you can use this, entang this, uh, uh, this entanglement spectrum for detecting topological phases. You can detect quantum phase transitions. Um, and I will show an example for that later. And um, another thing is that this entanglement spectrum is extremely hard to obtain from numerical simulations. So it would be extremely valuable if you have a method of measuring these things uh, in a quantum simulator. <clears throat> so, Christian, a quick question. Yeah. Um, the, the decomposition of upstairs is, is the source for the students and everybody in the audience. This is the Schmidt decomposition or it's something else you're doing? What exactly, we call, this is the Schmidt It's just the Schmidt, okay. okay. Oh. Yeah, just the Schmidt decomposition, right, yeah. Right, right, fine, yeah. it is. Um, so, this is, uh, yeah, if you want to get this entanglement spectrum from, uh, from a numerical simulation, you really need a wave function based method. And even then it's very hard uh, to calculate. Um, so you might ask, is there actually a way, do we actually know, are there proposals on how to measure this entanglement spectrum? Uh, and indeed there are, there is uh, a paper from Hannes Bichler et al in uh, PRX 2016. And he proposes here a protocol of how to extract this entanglement spectrum. And this is um, a pretty complicated protocol where you need a lot of copies on, on, of your quantum system. I just explain very briefly uh, how, what, what the idea behind this is. 
uh, you have many copies and by implementing swap operations between these copies, they show in this paper that you can basically realize an effective time evolution uh, with your density matrix. And by looking at the Loschmidt echoes of this time evolution, you can then extract the entanglement spectrum. So long story short, it's a very interesting, very beautiful proposal, but it is very challenging to implement in an actual experiment. Um, there is another proposal on uh, how to learn something about the entanglement spectrum. This is a bit unrelated. This is why I have separated this here a bit uh, from Marcello Dalmonte. Uh, and what he proposes here is not to measure the entanglement spectrum on the quantum state that you have, but sort of realizing this entanglement Hamiltonian directly in a separate, in a separate experiment and then you probe the eigenstates of the entanglement Hamiltonian via spectroscopy. Uh, and actually, as far as I know, all other methods that exist for obtaining this entanglement spectrum have something to do with quantum state tomography. Um, there is one uh, proposal uh, in a, from, from the IBM group, or not a proposal, the IBM group in 2018, actually did a measurement uh, of the entanglement spectrum uh, on, a, on a four qubit subsystem. Uh, and what they did was full tomography of the four qubit subsystem. So um, for four qubits, you have, uh, for each qubit, you have four possible operators, which is uh, the identity and the three Pauli matrices. <clears throat> so you have in total for four qubits, you have four to the four measurement bases. And what they did here is they measured all of these Pauli strings, constructed the complete density matrix and diagonalized it. Um, and uh, there are also ways of making this quantum state tomography more efficient. Um, and I list here a couple of them. There is projected least squares, which uh, has become very prominent recently because it is so simple. This is really enormously simple to implement. Then there are methods like low rank matrix recovery. What you do here is you write down an ansatz for your density matrix uh, as a low rank matrix, and then you fit this ansatz to your, to, to your experimental data. Um, there is compressive sensing, uh, MPS tomography, and uh, neural network quantum state tomography. Uh, what I want to say here is uh, all, all these all these methods here that make tomography more efficient, they assume that the, that the state that you have in your lab has a certain structure. So this method here, as an example, assumes that your density matrix has a low rank or MPS tomography assumes that your state uh, is a matrix product state with a low bond dimension. In neural network quantum state tomography, uh, you assume that there is a certain structure in your quantum state so that you can learn something about your quantum state. So all these methods assume a structure in the state. And uh, what we are doing here, or the question that, that we are asking. Uh, uh, hold on. May, Christian, yeah. may I ask you a question? Well, I, yes. I just wanted to add a comment. I'm Jose Ignacio. Yeah. Well, we, we did publish this year. I, I'm also a former collaborator of Barbara. Uh, we did publish a paper this year where we do the, the we find the spectrum by just adding a layer of two unitaries to Alice and Bob to the two parts that actually find uh, the the diagonal form. So actually, there is no need for the tomography. Rather, you train that the eigenvalue is coincide, and then every reading is a sampling of the lambdas. I mean. That there is a, these are the, this shortcut for the for tomography, okay? Because you are not looking for the eigenvectors, okay? You don't need full tomography, and the way to cut this out is by by adding this further training to the diagonal basis, and this is quite efficient depending on the entropy of the system. So if you have a large entropy, you need more training. If you have less entropy, you you need less training. But on simulations, it is really very efficient. Okay. I, I, I see. Yeah, th thank you. Thank so it's, you a, it's, a, it's a variational method, Jose Ignacio? Yeah, once you have the state, you add a variational layer that simply does the, the Schmidt decomposition for you. 
to the eigenvalues. So you, it, you also can't retrieve the eigenvectors. What you cannot retrieve is the phase. But then if you are just interested in the entanglement spectrum, is more efficient than, than any tomography. So actually you only measure in the computational basis only. So you save these four to the end uh, experiments. Maybe we can discuss at the end as well a bit more yeah. and, uh, as we usually do on the more technical okay. afterwards. Christian, yeah. I think I agreed to stay right. on for a little bit. But thanks for, uh, we're a small group, reasonably small group, please, uh, you know, feel free to direct your questions to me as well or, or on your mic. We'll try to not break the flow of Christian too much, but uh, keep what- No, it's, it's, it's fine. Us. Thanks for the comment. I was not, uh, not aware of that. Uh, All right. All right, cheers, let's go, yeah. Um, okay. Um, so uh, the question that we are asking here is, um, can we do some, some sort of more uh, efficient form of tomography uh, where we bring in some, some insights uh, from, from physics? So we're asking the question, is there actually something uh, that we know about the, the reduced density matrix? Uh, and indeed, there is something that we know, and uh, this comes from, uh, which is very interesting, these things, they come from uh, quantum field theory. Uh, and this is, uh, this is actually an, an old result from, from axioma axiomatic field theory from Bisognano and Wichmann, which they published in 1976. Uh, which says if you if you have a ground state and uh, under certain assumptions, which and these assumptions are that the Hamiltonian density of your field theory is invariant uh, under a Lorentz boost, um, then the entanglement Hamiltonian for this ground state uh, is a simple deformation of your system Hamiltonian, and what you all that you have to do is you have to put a gradient uh, on on this density. Um, so if you, if you think about this, well, what this means, so this is actually, this theorem is true if you have an infinite system and, and you piper tight uh, this, this system, so your two subsystems actually, uh, actually are infinite. Um, and, and what this means is uh, you, have, you have two subsystems, B and A, and, you, and uh, this theorem says that on the subsystem A, you should put here, this, this gradient, this, this linear slope. Uh, and, and, this, and this gives you directly uh, the entanglement Hamiltonian of your system. Um, so what's the intuition behind this? If you think about this, uh, what this means, um, if, you, if you think about the representation of the density matrix as e to the minus beta h, this x, uh, which, which you multiply on the Hamiltonian can be understood as a, as a local inverse temperature. And, this, and because of this linear trend here, this local inverse temperature is small at the entanglement cut and is large far away. So this basically means that you have uh, a high temperature close to the, uh, close to the cut uh, and a low temperature uh, far away. Uh, and this is kind of intuitive because it simply says the constituents of your system that are close to this entanglement cut are more entangled with the rest of the system that the constituents that are further away. Um, but Bisognano Wichmann tells you more than that. It also tells you that the Hamiltonian uh, is really the system Hamiltonian. Uh, of course, this is now an, a result from quantum field theory. And the question is, how well does this actually apply for our models we are interested in for this quantum lattice models? And there are a couple of works uh, which are basically, uh, most of them are from the group of Marcello Dal Monte, where they investigate this and they find that uh, this kind of Bisognano Wichmann applies remarkably well for a lot of ground states for in, in a lot of lattice models. Um, let me just add here that um, this Bisognano Wichmann theorem is if the system is infinite, uh, there are also calculations if you have a finite subsystem with, within an infinite system, so if the, if, the, if the subsystem A has a finite size, and then this local temperature is predicted to be a parabola. So it's not, a, it's not linear, but uh, it's like 
uh, a parabolic rise from the entanglement cut. So this is for ground states and um, for the more interesting situation, which is quench dynamics, um, there is also something that we know uh, for one dimensional systems. Um, and in uh, what, uh, what, is, what is people here in conformal field theory uh, say, so, so, so this uh, for, for one dimensional systems, uh, there are analytical results for this entanglement Hamiltonian that are provided by conformal field theory. And um, this, is, uh, this is a very pe peculiar situation. So if you have a reduced density matrix that has this form, so you have to start with a very particular initial state, which they call a conformal boundary state. And then you time evolve, um, uh, time evolve this state with your Hamiltonian. If you then from this, from this density matrix trace out uh, the environment to obtain the reduced density matrix, um, there exists predictions for, for this entanglement Hamiltonian, which are derived by conformal mappings. And uh, they derive formulas that look like this. So this is uh, an integral over the subsystem size. This gamma function I introduced here are actually um, pretty complicated functions, but they are analytically known. And then there are two things that appear here, this t of x of t and this t bar of x of t, uh, which are the energy, which is the energy momentum tensor. So, so this, uh, this is given by t not not plus t not one and t not not is the energy density of the system and t and t not one is the, is the momentum density. So is there a possibility to put this kind of prediction on a lattice? A and there is, of course, it's obvious for the energy density there you would just take your Hamiltonian uh, and you can also construct a, a lattice analog of this, of this momentum density, uh, which has been done in this paper by Ashley Milstead and, and Gifre Vidal. And uh, you can define this, this lattice momenta if you, have, if you have a Hamiltonian that is local, so a sum over local terms, uh, you can define this lattice momenta as, com as commutators of, of your Hamiltonian terms. And then these this T components appearing here in this entanglement Hamiltonian ansatz are just given by the Hamiltonian components plus the momentum density and this T bar that appears here is just the Hamiltonian components minus the momentum density. So in this, um, in, in, in this situation of quantum quench dynamics, when the Hamiltonian uh, that you quench to is, this, is described by a conformal field theory, uh, then we also have an idea of what this entanglement Hamiltonian is. Um, the fact that the quench Hamiltonian is described by a conformal field theory uh, basically means that in your system, you have to quench to a critical point because the critical point uh, is inv invariant under, under these conformal mappings. Um, there is uh, also uh, th this, this expression here for the entanglement Hamiltonian, this holds for all times, uh, but you can also look uh, in the long time limit, what happens at, at long times. Uh, and what you find is this, this terms T not one and T, uh, so this T not one and uh, they, they cancel each other in the long time limit. So this, this local lattice momenta, uh, which actually describe uh, propagations of, of uh, quasi particles that uh, spread entanglement, they disappear in the long time limit. So if you take the long time limit of this formula, you again find that your entanglement Hamiltonian is just a deformation of your system Hamiltonian with a local temperature. Uh, and this local temperature uh, takes, takes this form here. And uh, uh, this, this is how it looks. If you, plot, if you plot this function, I took this picture from, from, this, uh, from this PRL from Weisu. And um, what you see here is that this local temperature is constant in the bulk and then to the entanglement cut, uh, it, it decreases, uh, which means that you have a high local temperature uh, at the entanglement cut. 
and actually that this Hamiltonian, uh, so that uh, that in the bulk of your subsystem, the reduced density matrix is really just e to the minus beta h uh, with h your system Hamiltonian. Um, this is actually consistent with the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis that uh, says that in the long time limit, you expect your subsystem to, to thermalize. Um, so these are sort of predictions that we have from, from uh, axiomatic field theory and from conformal field theory, which provide us with ideas of how the entanglement Hamiltonian looks like. Um, and uh, we can use now these ideas to construct an ansatz for the reduced density matrix. And we can then fit this ansatz uh, to, to the experimental observations. Uh, so what we are doing is, uh, is, is really the following. We write down this ansatz and uh, in this work, and this uh, has some his historical reasons, our experimental observations are, uh, are probabilities. Uh, so, so what we actually do is we sample the quantum state uh, with local random unitaries. So we choose a set of, of local random single qubit rotations uh, construct a unitary with this and then uh, sample the quantum state under the action of this random unitary. And this provides us with probabilities for observing a certain spin configuration under this unitary action. Uh, so what we have um, also from the experiment and uh, what we do in our simulations is we construct a set of histograms. So for each of these unitaries, U1, uh, U2, U3, and so on, uh, we have we have a histogram that shows us the probability that a certain spin configuration pops up. So these are the kind of data uh, that we that we have available. Uh, and what we do now is we construct an ansatz for this entanglement Hamiltonian that depends on variational parameters. And um, we find then the variational parameters of this ansatz in such a way uh, that uh, the distance to the experimental observations is minimized. So we construct this ansatz, which is written in here. Um, from this ansatz, we calculate this expectation values of these local unitaries. So this would give you the probability for observing a spin configuration under the unitary if you, would, if you sample this matrix. And we match this to the experimental observations. And uh, the minimization of this function here, this is our cost function. Uh, this provides us with the optimal parameters of the entanglement Hamiltonian. <clears throat> so this is basically the idea behind entanglement Hamiltonian tomography. Um, so I will show you now a couple of examples for this, uh, for, a, for a particular model. And the model that we are choosing uh, is, this, um, is a long range easing model. Uh, and the reason why we are choosing this model is because we basically have it downstairs in the lab and our experimentalists can, can implement uh, non-equilibrium dynamics uh, with this model. Um, but I will show you for this model, entanglement Hamiltonian tomography for the ground state. Um, in, in this, uh, the ground state of this model shows also a quantum phase transition. There is, um, for large values of B, the system is, is in a paramagnetic phase. And if B is much smaller than the J naught, then you enter a symmetry broken phase and there is a phase transition between these two phases. Uh, and I will also study uh, quench dynamics with this model, um, which, basically, uh, which basically works by preparing an initial state and then performing an instantaneous, instantaneous quench and we are interested in the reduced density matrix uh, as a function of time and, uh, and also the entanglement spectrum as a function of time. So let me show you some results. So this is our model, this long range easing model. Uh, it's actually not very long range, which I, I choose here a pretty, pretty small value of alpha. So this is really still almost pretty much nearest neighbor interactions. Uh, and you can now, die, you can, well, what I did here was doing a DMRG calculation for a very large system and extracting the reduced density matrix for a subsystem of eight sites. 
and calculating the entanglement spectrum, everything exactly. So these here are the first six eigenstates of the entanglement Hamiltonian. Uh, you can now make an ansatz for the entanglement Hamiltonian. And our ansatz looks like this. It has sort of the same structure as the system Hamiltonian. But uh, this coefficients Jij, uh, we, we motivate them by the Bisognano-Wichmann theorem. So what, what this here is a quadratic function, and this here as well. So we put a parabolic deformation on this uh, on this entanglement Hamiltonian, on the Jij tilde and Bi tilde. Um, and uh, if you, you can now fit this ansatz, as I explained before, to the experimental data. So I, I sampled this, this reduced density matrix uh, with 150 measurements and, and 150 unitaries. It's actually a pretty small number of measurements for the system size. And these orange lines here show you uh, uh, the, the, the entanglement spectrum that you get with the corresponding error bars. You see that the first two eigenstates of the entanglement spectrum, you, get, you actually get them exactly with this small number of measurements. And the higher lying entanglement spectrum are off, but this is already not very important because the Schmidt values are here already at a level at 10 to the minus 7. Um, and uh, if you look, if you look, for instance, here at at, at a particular value of the B field at the critical point here, uh, at this Hamiltonian coefficients, uh, at the coefficients of the entanglement Hamiltonian, you really see that they are linear. So it really confirms the Bisognano-Wichmann uh, theorem. Um, and if you calculate the fidelity with respect to the exact density matrix, you find a fidelity of 0.9978. So this ansatz is really the correct ansatz for the reduced density matrix. We were also looking at um, the, a, a scaling for a certain subsystem size. So this shows you the fidelity that you get uh, as a function of the, of the number of measurements that you do. And this orange points here is the entanglement Hamiltonian tomography. And we compared it to two other methods, common methods for quantum state tomography, which is projected least squares and, uh, and uh, low rank least squares with a rank two ansatz. Uh, and you can see that um, this entanglement Hamiltonian tomography reaches very, very quickly a, a high fidelity uh, with, respect, uh, with respect to the other methods, which has to do that it, that it is very efficiently parameterized. <clears throat> we can do now the same thing for quench dynamics. So we perform a quench with this, uh, with this long range easing model. Um, and uh, actually, actually here I just took the transverse field easing model. So alpha, alpha is infinite. Uh, and uh, I perform a quench. I start with the ground state of the model for B 2.5 in this paramagnetic phase, and I quench it to the critical point in a system of, of 22 sites. And this here is again uh, the entanglement spectrum as a function of time, uh, of, of the quench time um, for, for, for a subsystem on the right boundary. And I also plotted in here the, the von Neumann entropy as a function of time. You see that the entanglement entropy in the beginning rises pretty linearly and then a sort of non-equilibrium steady state is reached. Um, the ansatz that we make here is, is again of a similar form. It, so this first part has again the same form as the, as the Hamiltonian, uh, where we use the coefficients as parameters. And then we add some additional term. And this additional term uh, is motivated from this, from this momentum densities. So I explained before that uh, in this, uh, this momentum densities, they are given by commutators between the Hamiltonian terms. And if you commute this xx term with the c term, you get an xy term. So we uh, also introduce such, an un uh, such a term in this entanglement Hamiltonian ansatz. And again, if you sample the matrix with uh, 150 measurements and 150 unitaries, you can very nicely reproduce the entanglement spectrum um, these, uh, the, you, these are the values that you find with the corresponding error bands. 
and you can also look uh, at these fit parameters that, that come out from this entanglement Hamiltonian. Um, and what you see is that in the beginning, when the entanglement entropy grows, uh, they show a very uh, strong os oscillatory behavior. So they oscillate very strongly in the beginning. And then uh, they reach kind of a steady state in the region where this entropy becomes flat. Uh, and if you look at this, uh, at, at this Hamiltonian terms that corresponds to, uh, uh, to, this, to this momenta, to these quasi-particles that, uh, that's, that spread entanglement in the system, you find that they only have uh, a value at the beginning at short times, and then in the long time limit, they go uh, exactly to zero, exactly as it is predicted by conformal field theory. And Again, here we can do uh, a similar analysis uh, for, 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 the, for the scaling of the number of measurements. And you see again that the entanglement Hamiltonian sort of outperforms a low rank ansatz for the density matrix and uh, projected least squares. Um, so I'm coming now to the last part of my talk. Um, we are, where I want to show you that uh, this also works on real experimental data. Um, what our experimentalists can do uh, in, in the lab is they can implement exactly this long-range easing model, uh, but the way they do the experiments is a bit uh, different from the results I showed you so far. They perform a quench on the antiferromagnet, so they prepare these antiferromagnetic states, and then they perform a quench um, uh, with, uh, with a B field that is, uh, that is much, much larger than the maximum value in the JIJ matrix. And what this does is um, it preserves uh, the symmetry uh, of, uh, so, so of, of this initial state. Because this B field is so large that states with different total magnetization have very different, different energies. And during the dynamics, you cannot couple the states uh, with each other. Uh, so what I want to say is that our, our experimentalists are doing the experiment in a way where we don't know anything from conformal field theory, but we can still write down an ansatz for the entanglement Hamiltonian. Um, and uh, the ansatz that we write down in this case, the first part here is again the system Hamiltonian, which is deformed in some way. Uh, and then you can always add uh, some, somehow like before where we added these local momentum densities, you can also add here higher order terms and corrections, which maybe also include three body terms. Uh, so this is the ansatz that we, that we make here for the entanglement Hamiltonian. Uh, so how does this, does this look? Um, so we performed, uh, I, I performed a theoretical simulation of this quench uh, this gives you this here shows the exact entanglement spectrum as a function of time, uh, and you can make this ansatz and fit this ansatz to uh, to uh, this this sampled theory state, and you can actually see that uh, you you can very nicely reproduce this entanglement spectrum as a function of time. Now, in the experiment, uh, our our experimentalists they took data at a couple of time points here at uh, from zero to five milliseconds. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and what, what, you, what you can do here is uh, you can also fit this, we can now fit this ansatz to the experimental data that we have available. And this is shown in this inset. So these insets, they show the, the Schmidt values uh, and uh, the black dots here uh, are, uh, are the points that come from the exact theory simulation and the colored points, uh, they really come uh, from the experiment. Uh, what you can see here is that the, that the theory points are a bit higher uh, than, the, than the points from the experiment. So the experiment looks a bit more mixed. And this is uh, ba basically because uh, there is some, some decoherence going on in the experiment and we can, we can correct for that uh, by making a different ansatz for the reduced density matrix where we basically uh, add a depolarizing channel on the, on the reduced density matrix. And if you do that, 
you see immediately that the points from the experiment collapse, collapse very nicely onto the theoretical points. <clears throat> um, you might ask now what is, what is actually uh, what is actually the justification of these additional terms that I added and uh, can we verify them? Can we actually see that these terms help uh, if, you, if you add them? And we can do this uh, and uh, be, uh, so we, what, what we have here, you can, you can test the ansatz by a sort of fidelity estimation. Um, and uh, so I would like to refer you to, to, to this paper of, uh, to, of Andreas Elden uh, et al, uh, where, we, where, we, where you show that if you, have, if you have two density matrix, you can measure a cross-platform fidelity between these, two, between these two density matrix. So this was actually initially uh, invented for a sort of cross-platform verification of two quantum devices. Uh, so what we what we can do now is we have a certain data set in the experiment and we can split the data set into two parts and on one data set we perform our fitting of the entanglement Hamiltonian and the other data set somehow repre represents uh, the exact reduced density matrix that we have in the lab and we can now calc we can now measure this cross platform fidelity between these two states and if you do that you find uh, you, you you actually find that uh, this fidelity of this ansatz actually uh, matches uh, is is very good with respect to the reduced density matrix that you have in the lab. So this plot here shows the maximum fidelity for the experimental time points that we that we have. Um, you can play this game in a couple in a couple of different ways. Uh, so. You, you have actually three things. You have the, the density matrix from the entanglement Hamiltonian fit. You have a reduced density matrix in the lab and you also have a reduced density matrix from a theoretical simulation. And you can compare these things uh, with, with one another and to perform this kind of cross-platform verification test. Uh, and, this is, uh, and this is what, what comes out. So uh, this plot here basically is the theory experiment cross-platform verification. This is what has been done in this paper, but you can also compare the entanglement Hamiltonian ansatz with pure theory. Uh, what this shows basically is that uh, the data are sort of more consistent with itself than, than with the pure theory simulation. Um, I will skip this part. Uh, as, a, as a last slide, uh, I, would, I would like to show you that we can also do this uh, for, for a larger number of ions. So our experimentalists also took data for 20 ions. And um, I did now this entanglement Hamiltonian fitting for a subsystem in the center of these 20 ions, uh, just using as an ansatz uh, the same form as the, as the original system Hamiltonian. Um, and I did this at 10 milliseconds. So if you, for this model, if you look at the entanglement entropy as a function of time, it shows this behavior. And this 10 milliseconds, this is the latest time our experimentalists have taken. They are not quite in this, in this regime where the entropy saturates, they are a bit before that. But again, this is a subsystem of seven sites and the von Neumann entropy is six. So this is already a very mixed state. Uh, and if you perform this entanglement Hamiltonian tomography on, on this state, you can again look at the, at the Schmidt vectors for this, uh, at the Schmidt values for the seven qubit reduced density matrix. Uh, the black line comes from, from theory. Uh, the red data points are uh, for, from our uh, entanglement Hamiltonian tomography. And these this green data points are this, this famous projected least squares. Uh, which which sort of fails for for predicting here uh, for reconstructing such such a mixed state. And with this, I'm 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 at the end of my talk, and I uh, would like to thank you for your for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Christian uh, Richard Richard Club um, from uh, far. We have time for a few questions. Um, is uh, 
Is there anybody from the audience who wants to ask something at this stage? Um, we can discuss a bit more on the earlier points as well. I have, while people are thinking, I have uh, one or two. So um, I missed you there in the conformal field theory and quantum field theory parts, but um, I seem to have to have some um, recollection of a Haldane talk at some point about uh, tangled spectrum and to in specific topological um, um, systems. Have you so would your would your thing work for like AKLT models and topological type of many body Hamiltonians? Did you try for that? Um, we 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 haven't we haven't tried it here. So this this work is basically very much focused on the fact that we have data from the experiment that come from quench dynamics. So we would like we wanted to see this Schmidt decomposition live sort of as a as a function of time. Um, but uh, you would definitely have a point. It would be very interesting to uh, to try these things on um, uh, on on models uh, where, where where this entanglement spectrum somehow somehow really really has a meaning and where you really learn some new physics from the entanglement spectrum. Uh, so we are discussing that, and uh, I think we will we will try such things, uh, but uh, but it's not included in the in the current work. Right. Um, I have one or two more, but uh, let me see. Anybody in the audience wants to uh, jump in or ask anything? Um, I don't see if she sent it on the chat. I see uh, Jose Ignacio has uploaded his uh, the paper he mentioned earlier. We can look at it as well uh, at some point. The other question that might be um, so could you use this to probe to probe this thermalization, this many body localization, thermalization, phase transition, which is another kind of complex and 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 um, uh, issue in this in this kind of field. So what you're doing, basically you, you're quenching and you, you, by doing this, could you go back to, to the, the, main, the main idea of the method? Just want to grab a little bit, I, I've lost you somewhere in the conformity theory um, key. So instead of doing tomography, usually people, you, you have your many body system, you divide it into two subsystems. Yeah. You, and then you, you do full tomography, partial tomography if you want on, on, on one, you're trying to, to rebuild all your observables from there. Um, and that's kind of the standard way to do it. And there is, this is uh, there's something else that uh, Jose Ignacio mentioned earlier, we can discuss maybe more uh, later, but so what is the key difference? You're doing some sampling and some variational approach here based, based on this. Can you tell us a little bit in simpler words what's going on, assuming that people do not know, um, oh, there's more questions coming in. Um, much conformal field theory. What's what's the main physics here? What's the main idea? Um, so, so the main idea of the method is that you um, that or a, a lot of tomography methods actually work in this way that you make an ansatz for your reduced density matrix, like yes. in low rank tomography. Um, and the idea here is sort of the same. We make an ansatz for the reduced density matrix. But our ansatz is parametrized in this in terms of this entanglement Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. So the ansatz that we write down for the reduced density matrix is really given by e to the minus h a, this entanglement Hamiltonian, uh, and some and some normalization. And the point is that there are situations like ground states or uh, quench dynamics if you quench to a critical point where you actually sort of know what this entanglement Hamiltonian is. You know exactly the structure of this entanglement Hamiltonian. And this allows you to make a much more efficient ansatz, which mm. a much smaller number of parameters. And if you, if you fit such an ansatz to experimental observations, 
uh, you of course need a much much smaller amount uh, of measurements simply yeah, because this, your this is the key i think maybe you can we can discuss this the big problem in most of these experiments in many body systems whether for any application running an algorithm so showing supremacy or implementing something is as the system becomes this you have to do partial tomography you can't really do uh, you know too many measurements people do few hundreds of thousands or millions and that's it so how would this help um, in this case <coughs> um, how many measurements did you did they do in this case for the Isaac model that you um, so here so, here in, in um, so if you would do this way traditionally with the traditional demographic uh, uh, what did you gain by doing this, uh, your method? Uh, I think you mentioned uh, 100,000, how many measurements were there? So for, for, our, for our experimental data, um, they took so many measurements. Actually, they took uh, 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 five, they choose 500 different unitaries and performed 150 measurements per such a unitary. Uh, so in this case, these are so many measurements that uh, actually a standard tomographic would method work, exactly, also yeah. would also work here. Uh, we use this data just to, to demonstrate that uh, such a fitting method, uh, method works. Um, but uh, actually sometimes, in, especially for this, uh, for this ground state, um, as, as an example, um, there, there are your Ansatz, because you have this idea from this bisoniano wichmann theorem, you can write down a very efficient ansatz for this entanglement Hamiltonian that basically just has three parameters that you have to fit. Mm -hmm. It's a theta naught, theta one, theta two, and it's the same, it's the same here. Uh, and because this is such an efficient ansatz, you actually can, uh, can infer uh, properties of this entanglement spectrum from actually a ridiculously small number. That's of very measurements. interesting, actually. Yeah, this I, very I, interesting. I, 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 I tried. How, how big actually, is the, the? How many sites is this one? The Hamiltonian. Uh, the, here, here the subsystem yeah. site is eight. Uh, yeah, I, I also tried it. Tried it for ten. Um, okay. But uh, so, it, it's a. Uh, but for I, I actually. Uh, with with this ansatz, I I tried once. I I don't uh, maybe I should include this in 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 future talks. Um, you can measure this entanglement gap, the difference between these these two uh, lowest uh, eigenvalues of this entanglement Hamiltonian. Uh, you can you can see this phase transition um, with something about uh, 400 measurements per point. So you do. Uh, in this case, I did 150 unitaries and 150 measurements. But if you would just be interested in the entanglement gap, um, by using this ansatz, 20 unitaries and 20 measurements per unitary uh, are enough. And uh, actually, what this what this plot here shows, this here on, in the in the lower right corner, uh, this this shows this somehow that uh, with this entanglement Hamiltonian ansatz, you very very quickly. Uh, reach a good fidelity with uh, with a quite a small number uh, small number of measurements. There's one and more question. Course, uh, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, let, let me just add. I mean, another thing is, as you as you see here, uh, by doing such a such a type of tomography, uh, you do not only recover the density matrix from a very small number of measurements, but at the same time, by looking at this coefficients of the entanglement Hamiltonian, you could also uh, learn something about the physics that is going on in your system. Like, like here, uh, these x, y terms, they correspond to, to propagating quasi-particles that spread entanglement. And uh, uh, you basically see this, uh, see this, that they have some value in, in the initial part and then go to zero. So um, by anal analyzing this ansatz, you at the same time, uh, it, this is in contrast of doing blind tomography. You somehow also learn something about the physics that is going on in your system. Um, Dimitris, I, yes. I should, uh, can I make two comments? Because I, I yes, should yes. be going now. Okay. Uh, uh, Christian, is this method uh, working for only for integrable systems or 
as soon as you quit integrability, the, the answer this much is not known. I think it relates to the other question by Daniel as well in this order, but oh, yes, sorry. please. You know, it's, it's a very good question. There's one more by Daniel, one of our posts. Because, you know, if you have X, X, and Z, all the X, Y models are integrable, and, and there are very old papers that, that found explicitly this Hamiltonian. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I, I think, so I, I took this example here for short range interactions simply because it, this CFT here can be seen pretty nicely. But but it but it always but it it will work as soon as your is as you have a system uh, in which the quench dynamics is uh, is sort of described by this conformal field theory. So I th I don't think it's a requirement. So, so both Hubbard models and things like this. Would you all phase transitions? Yeah, you can. Um, I, I mean, the the general method of 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 writing down an ansatz. Um, of this entanglement Hamiltonian, of course, you can always do that. Uh, the question is is just how much is is yeah. such an ansatz supported by conformal field theory or by axiomatic yeah. field theory? For 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 the Hubbard model for ground states, uh, I think that this uh, uh, Bisognano-Wichmann theorem also applies very well. I actually know this. Uh, we checked we checked the Hubbard model for ground states. Okay. Uh, for quench dynamics, I cannot give uh, a, a good answer here, but uh, it would be interesting to to investigate. Um, and I have, yeah, go, go may ahead. I have the second because I should. Please, be yeah, yeah, please, please, yeah. The second is yes. Can, could, could I share for a second the the idea for Tomac? Uh, please do, please go ahead. Yeah, you can share your which is as well, if you want which more. is not uh, related to Tomac Roshi, and just to give you an example of another way of proceeding. It's just a second. So this is it, and um, you know it's a it's just achieving a singular value decomposer. Can you see the screen? Yeah, I can, okay, yeah, yeah. we in a quantum way. Okay, and the basic idea is very, very, very simple. Uh, here you have it. So you want to achieve that, and a way to do that is apply a circuit to your state such that you train to have the very same eigenvector, and therefore necessarily because this does not change entanglement, the eigenvalues must be respected. So you can train just uh, um, to coincidence. So this is what you're training. You see, yeah, as soon as you train your secret A, U and V to have coincidence, you read out automatically without any tomography that every measurement is giving you a sampling of lambda. Coincidence, so what do you mean coincidence? You mean like the same eigenvectors? Or... Yeah. Okay. So when you measure in this state, you demand the training, the chi square mm -hmm. that is simply that there is coincidence. If I measure the first element of the computational mm -hmm. basis, it should have the same here. So mm -hmm. the drawing is how here. Does, how, how does the training work exactly? Yeah. Here, here you see it again. So you simply apply two different unitaries and you demand the same thing. And you keep training thetas and omegas such that this thing happens. And you can do it, and well, this is a plot of the expected entropies versus the measure entropies, and the convergence is is rather fast. It may so, be a slightly slower if you have um, if you have a lot of entropy. Uh, if it is peaked, uh, it is faster. But you see, but, the but rationale, you, yeah, is I mean. If if your Schmidt vectors have a complicated structure, is it then it also? That's okay. That, that doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, but for this, uh, as the kind of problems you are doing is extremely fast to get. At mm -hmm. least these plots are random states. So these are very... random with maximal entropy, essentially, and uh, they are trained very fast. So you variation and learn the 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 Smith uh, coefficients basically. That's what you're doing. Yeah. That's exactly. And then if you want to recover the vectors, well, these U's and V's would tell you what are the Schmidt vectors, okay? So, but this is an option we have later, okay? So, but if you just want the lambdas, that this is a proof that you don't need to go through all the tomography because you are asking just for the reduced amount of information, okay? And uh, there are many protocols you can do once you take the state to this diagonal form because you can do, you can show that you can, show that you can have a, a swap without quantum communication. You can, you can do an auto encoder. Well, there are many properties that automatically follow from here. 
and it is very simple to implement. Okay, very good because you have all the elements of the. You did all this variational to create the state with your Hamiltonian. Just you add now these two, and you train for equal agreement, and every reading is a sampling of lambdas. Okay, so right away yeah, yeah. you are sampling. Um. But uh, yeah, it's it's just I mean that for the, for the training, I mean of course, uh, I, I guess you also need to repeat this a lot of times. Yeah, not a, that's what I said. That the reason that you are not going through full tomography and you don't have to use all the possible bases, this is only one base, not four to the n. Okay, one, the yeah. diagonal. So it turns out that then when you do the counting, it turns out to be pretty fast, as at least you know, without uh, errors. The number of layers, the convergence is very fast and the number of parameters, it's, it's under control. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, sorry, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, go, go so I'm, I'm Rick, I'm one of Christian's yeah. collaborators from Innsbruck. Yes. So does this then also, this works only for equal uh, partitions? Uh, okay, no. If, it can be extended. I, I'm showing you for equal, but it can be extended. If one okay. uh, Hilbert space is larger, you only need, uh, you have freedom in the second vector, okay? Okay. So you yeah, have okay. a freedom. There, there, there are many other unitaries that would work and you simply don't need to train that, okay? But this okay. is indeed display. And look, it's an, a beautiful thing that, that we just showed that if you do that, and then you classically communicate the unitaries, you can do a swap where the communication was all the time classical. Or you can do an autoencoder automatically. Simply because you brought the state to an extremely clean form. Right? So the basic idea is to use, you're using variational algorithms to get the state. Well, keep using a little bit more and you read out. You measure and you read out. And then you can do swapping, you can do autoencoding, you can do plenty of things. Simply, the philosophy is that you, you leave the Smith decomposition to a secret, to a to variational secret. And uh, it did, it, it worked. And later on, we did the same thing for three qubits, uh, the tangle, and you can read the tangle in a very fast way. As compare, imagine, when, you know, it's a mess to compute the tangle because you need accuracy for all the, the elements. Instead, if you bring to a canonical form the state, then it turns out that the tangle can be measured as a product of two numbers. Okay. Good. Well, I'm sorry that I have to leave, but uh, since you were discussing ways of, I like very much the idea. And actually, I think what Dimitri said is very nice. You know, the, the entanglement spectrum is what characterizes certain phases in physics, yes. and that's physics at hardcore. And in the same ways that the entanglement entropy is fantastic to determine the phase transitions, to determine topological order, that's what you need. Yes. So if your method applies to two-dimensional systems, you can You'll address this yeah. thing. That would be really spectacular. And if you can- I think Haldane that. had some work. I've seen some talks. Oh, yeah. some but, um, That's uh, the origin of the of yeah, the yeah, yeah, first yes. papers. Yes, the first yes. paper with the word entanglement spectrum was exactly. yes, Haldane, and it was to see that there is a gap in the eigen. So it'd be very cool to try, you know, the same thing. Take your your um, machinery now and take a KLT Hamiltonian, for example, and, well, and you know, you know and, any, and, and attack it. Any 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 Hamiltonian we know has toroidal codes, uh, yeah, all the has codes topological that, yeah. order. Yeah, That's so. it. Yeah, I. I yeah, really we, yeah. would love to, to see these things. That's why I was a little bit concerned about whether you depend dramatically on conformal K theory because many of these other methods, uh, theor theories do not have a... It's, 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 you can just see it more like this, that this conformal field theory things, they give you a suggestion for the, for yeah. the answers in certain situations. I agree with you. The point is that often like in integrability, the, the magic is that you keep locality. Okay, you apply the jordan wigner transformation to the Heisenberg model and you get extreme a non-local term that covers all the system. So it is not that the techniques cannot be used, it's whether they are really the element that trivializes the problem. You have the guarantee when you have integrability because there, there are lax pairs, there are plenty of things that you don't see 
but they are happening. There are infinitely many conserved quantities and so on, which is not the case as you move to other conformal field theories. And it is definitely not the case when you go to two dimensions and topology. But if the method could be applied there and you have chips which are square, well, I think it would be, mm -hmm. I, I really good, would love good. to see that. Very good. Sorry, I have For to saying I'm to, sorry to interrupt yeah, you. Yeah, no, and Christian, let me just congratulate you. I like very much your thanks, talk. Thanks, thanks, yeah. And, and, thank uh, and bring my regards your... to your team. To yes. Peter yeah, thanks, and Barbara. Thank you for your comments and for, for pointing out your work. Thank you. Good. Good. Thank you. So Bye -bye. Um, um, one more question by Daniel, which is a senior postdoc in our group. I'll, I'll, uh, it's, it's at the chat. Uh, what if there is disorder at, in your system? Will your answer still work well, or would you need to measure the profile of the disorder potential to obtain a better answer? Uh, which which kind of disorder potential? I'm not sure. In the magnetic field, for example. Um, can, can you repeat the question maybe once more? Uh, uh, if you go to the chat, you can see it actually. It's on the, uh, on the, on the, uh, to everyone. You should have maybe received it. So what if there is disorder in your system? Just click on the chat. Uh, will your answers still work well, or would you need to measure the profile of the disorder potential to obtain a better answer? Basically, so what's like if there is disorder, like in this Ising model, for example, which is yeah. uh, you know a cause for many body localization or different things there. If you have them, or, uh, um, how things change. Uh, it breaks integrability as well. Disorder, no, in this case, or. Yes, uh, I mean, I guess goes back to the earlier question. With yeah, my my, my answer. So, so let me let me give um, maybe not the most the most intelligent answer, but in in principle, you can uh, you can make this this ansatz. And actually, for the for the experiment, we also extended this ansatz a bit not just taking this row A ansatz, but also adding some depolarizing channel on it with, uh, with some P. Um, and you can also use P as a variational parameter. So, so you, can, you can maybe write down an ansatz uh, that accounts for certain so sources of noise in your experiment. And uh, then of course you ask do, does, the, does the method still work? And the question is, how do you, how do you see that? How do you, how do you verify that? Uh, and my answer would be that, uh, which I basically tried to explain in this, on this slide, uh, that if you have constructed an, an offline representation of your reduced density matrix in this e to the minus he format, uh, you can then um, compare it with what you actually have in the lab by doing this uh, cross-platform fidelity test. So you have a reduced density matrix on your classical computer that you constructed by this fitting procedure. And by measuring this fidelity, you can always verify how good your answer is. So the, the answer to your question is, yes, you can always do it. And you can also check uh, how, how good it is. Um, I, I guess that if you have such sources uh, of, of decoherence, then uh, maybe um, you would have to add additional terms. So these kind of things are likely to mess up uh, your, your, uh, your conformal field theory ansatz, for an example. But uh, the, the idea is also that this method can actually also be used uh, for uh, in situations where you don't know anything about the entanglement Hamiltonian, the, 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 this conformal field theory provides us with suggestions, but you can al always add terms and then verify them by this cross-platform fidelity test. Good, thank you. Any other questions, comments, points, anyone?
I think uh, there are uh, uh, nice. I, I have one last one on the first part on the other paper, the variation of the nature. Um, yes. If you go back to the slide where you had the uh, eigenstates and the excited state, you, you show that ground state and excited states both are right. Yeah. So excited states are usually harder to, to get. And you know, you have to minimize a different, uh, you have to write down your cost function in a different way and so on. So would you, would you like to share a bit more details on what, what did you do there for the excited um, So so, uh, so these lines here that I plot here, they are uh, just indicate the exact values that mm. come from, uh, that, that you would get if you di exactly diagonalize this model, then you would have the ground state energy here and the first excited state here. Um, in this uh, work, uh, ah, so we- were looking for the ground state, you didn't look for the excited state here. Here, here we didn't look for okay, the- Okay, the okay, good, confused. Right. I thought you, there was an experiment on, on probing the excited state. Uh, we, tried a bit, we tried a bit around with preparing the excited states and we actually did this for, for a very small number of qubits, mm. uh, but it didn't make it in, in the paper in the end. I see, I see, I see. I was confused with the line, I thought it was theory plus some experimental dots, but this is yes. only for the ground state, okay. So, so these, these two things, we, we only optimize here for the ground yeah. state. Okay. Cool, cool, nice. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I th any other questions, anyone? We will have a follow-up session. I think we had uh, quite a few questions here. So if there is anyone either from CQT or my group that wants to ask anything else. Yeah, I have a question uh, regarding this slide. Where is uh, Benjamin? Yeah, yeah. go ahead, Ben. <laughs> Uh, so uh, you mentioned like over here you use uh, some sort of uh, optimizer that can find the global minimum. Uh, is it one that is like uh, suited for like quantum optimization specifically, uh, or or is it just like a, a you know something like what is the the optimizer? Like are you able to share more details about the optimizer that you use here? Uh, yes, uh, I I can. Um, so the optimizer, actually, uh, Rick uh, van Bynien, who just uh, spoke just a moment ago, uh, was actually the, the main person behind, behind this optimization algorithm. Uh, so I'm not sure, maybe, maybe Rick, do you want to say a couple of words about this? Or? Sure, uh, no problem. Um, so the optimization algorithm, so your question is, which algorithm did we use here, or is it more uh, general, the question? Uh, yeah, yeah, some, something like, yeah, like which optimizer do you guys uh, use over here? Okay, so I mean, in principle, you can use any uh, out-of-the-box optimization algorithm. Um, but the problem is that you are dealing with uh, projected measurements, so you always have uh, pretty large error bars on your points. So in there, many methods actually fail. So, so for instance, gradient-based methods, which try to estimate the gradient from... Uh, from sampling at nearby points, they, they have a hard time, in our experience at least. So we went eventually for a gradient-free method. And the one that I implemented here, uh, ultimately it's called, uh, it's based on an algorithm, it's called DIRECT. So you, where you, it's a, an acronym for uh, dividing rectangles. So you divide your su su search space into rectangles and in each um, rectangle you you sample once or about in, in this case you you try to get one estimator for the cost function value and then you have your space it's divided in, in rectangles everywhere I have values but then you have to decide which rectangle do I now want to uh, uh, investigate closer so which one do I want to divide in smaller rectangles um, then obviously the ones which have a low function value are good candidates but also um, rectangles which are very large because they just have statistically a higher chance of having the global minimum. So you kind of make a trade-off between how large are the rectangles and how good are the function values. And then you decide which ones you sample further. So I divide them in smaller rectangles and sample there at the, at the centers. And then you sort of uh, continuously keep refining uh, the search space into smaller and smaller cells. So this is 
from this you get a mathematical guarantee that you will find the global uh, minimum. If you just search long enough, it will always find the global minimum. Um, and on top of that, we found that this algorithm is uh, quite robust to noise on the cost function values. Uh, and you can add some, some nice extensions on to, to make it more robust. So we got away with, with quite a few samples per point. Um, so in the paper, we took 90 shots per point, but there was more because of a, a technical overhead. So if you, uh, uh, ultimately, we needed about uh, 10 or 20 shots per point, and the algorithm would also work. But it's just if you ask for 10 shots, it's, uh, it's as expensive as asking for 90 shots for the experiment, because there's some overhead in sending the data back and forth. So this, if you compare to other papers in the literature where they do optimization, they very often go for thousands of shots per point. So I think you can save a lot of effort there. Yeah. And I mean, and rest, yeah, okay, the rest is uh, it's written in the paper, or if you have further questions, you can ask me later. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, if there are no more questions, let's thank uh, Christian again for a very nice talk. In, um, and thank you all for staying uh, and, and joining and staying for so long as well. Um, we'll the talk will be on online at, in a few weeks time after, after the paper. And I'll see you at the 10th session in a couple of weeks. I'll, uh, I'll be advertised. Thank you, Christian. Thanks. You're welcome. Cheers.